everyone. Welcome to the Meniere's Muse podcast. My name is Heather, and I was diagnosed with Meniere's disease and vestibular migraine in 2017 and found myself craving connection with other warriors and found the more warriors I met, the more inspired I was, and that my hope for healing came to life. I created this podcast to share stories of vestibular warriors, regardless of their diagnosis or where they are on their journey, to give hope so no one feels alone. If this podcast may benefit you or someone in your life, please forward this to them and make sure you hit the subscribe button. If you know someone with an inspiring story, please find my contact information below. We all have a story. Let yours inspire others. Before I continue, I feel I must mention by listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or consultations with your healthcare professionals. We're here to share stories and give hope. Please consult your own physician for any medication questions or medical issues that you may be having. Our bodies are uniquely ours and something that may work for one person may not necessarily work for you. I am such a fan of today's guest, Janine. She is a Jersey girl and a 25 year veteran of the entertainment industry, having created and implemented tactical public relation campaigns, events, marketing promotions for numerous studios, including HBO, Universal, and Cohen Media Group, where she led the publicity campaign for the Academy Award-winning film, The Salesman. More recently, she's made the transition into development and production, creating second chapter productions. She is producing and directing her first documentary feature, Unheard, The Ears of Meniere's. This is a passion project that will unravel the mystery surrounding Meniere's disease. With this documentary, Janine hopes to take people on a journey to understanding on a deeper level what living with these symptoms is really like using visual and audio simulations so the audience actually experiences what it's like to have vertigo, tinnitus, and hearing distortion. Please welcome Janine. Well, welcome Janine. I'm so happy that we finally connected. I think our paths crossed many, many times, but Mm -hmm. we've never actually just sat and talked. Yes, I think it's all been over Facebook, a couple chats yeah. here and yeah. there, but this is the first time. And when you started your podcast, I was really excited to delve into it. And now I'm thrilled that you've invited me on. Yes, I am too. And you just said you have your own podcast. Uh, yes, it's a podcast with a film group that I belong to called New York Women in Film and Television, NYWIFT. And oh. we have a chat called Women Crush Wednesdays. And every other Wednesday, we interview women working in the entertainment field. So it could be anybody from a producer to a gaffer, doesn't matter. So uh, it's a volunteer position, but I've been part of the organization for years. So I help produce and do interviews and co-host and edit a lot of the same things you're doing. So I know what it takes to put this together. Oh, it's, it's actually, you know, just a, it's a passion and it doesn't, it's not, it's like a job, but it's not. <laughs> yes, I totally understand. Were you doing that um, prior to your vestibular symptoms? Any of that? No, that actually came after. I think I started with the podcast about four years ago. And a good friend of mine who was on the board of the organization was doing the podcasting and she needed someone to help co-host with her. So I thought, oh, this sounds like so much fun. And then she ended up leaving and moving and I kind of took it over. So it's interesting that I'm the one who edits it when I'm the one out of all of us that have the hearing issues. So that that's always a thing, but it, it right. keeps me sharp. I think it's a good thing too. That's great. Well, starting that, can you take us back to um, before your vestibular symptoms and how that came on? And then we'll dive into what you're doing now because you've got so much exciting stuff going on. Sure. Um, I was diagnosed back in 20... 20- 13. So up until then, you know, life was good. I had no issues. I was feeling good. I was working um, at HBO at the time as a publicist. And it was January of 2013. So 
I started feeling some heaviness on the side, my right side. I was getting the tinnitus, uh, that kind of sound like uh, static. Or you, when you go to a concert and you're next to the speaker too long, and mm -hmm. then after you come back from that, it's like <sighs> kind of sound. Yeah. And I thought it was just because I was out watching the football playoffs with my friends and we were in loud, noisy bars on Saturday and Sunday. And I'm like, okay, this is gonna go away. And after a week or two, it didn't go away. So I went to the doctors, they said, oh, it's an ear infection, here's some antibiotics. So I took the antibiotics and you know, it eventually went away, which I thought it was because it was just an ear infection. But as we now know, our symptoms come and go. And I didn't realize that, oh, okay, it just kind of subsided. So short version is six months of this with the issue going back and forth, where it was mainly the hearing issues. And then there was a slight bit of dizziness and imbalance, but I didn't have vertigo right away. I didn't have those kind of instant attacks that a lot of other people do. So finally, I said, this has to be more than just some kind of chronic ear infection. And I went to an ENT. I went through my symptoms and he immediately said to me, oh, this sounds like Meniere's disease. So at least I went to a doctor who kind of knew what it was originally. And the terminology Meniere's disease was a little scary. I'm like a disease, like what, you know, you think disease, you think death, you think like this is a horrible thing. So he sent me for some tests, but they were basically just um, audiology tests. I didn't go through the MRI, the CT scans that I think most people are supposed to go through to kind of rule a lot of things out. Um, and after those tests, I came back to him and he said, yes, it's been years and here's a diuretic and good luck. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. And it, he's a nice, he, he was a nice doctor. And, and I thought, okay, you know, he explained it was chronic to do a low salt diet and to try to manage your symptoms. Didn't really tell me much beyond that. And then it was that whole thing I think we all go through where you're at the computer and you're at Google yeah. and you're like, what is this? What's going on? How do I manage this? So it was for me a little bit more progressive than a lot of other people, especially now that I've heard a lot of other stories. Are you and talking about your hearing loss? Is that what you mean? Well, about the hearing loss and about the symptoms in general, because so many people talk about how they have those big issues and onsets of vertigo right away and the spinning and the nausea and the vomiting that didn't come for me until a couple of years into my diagnosis. Oh. So in the beginning, I was just on diuretic. I was trying to manage low salt diet, but I'm not a cook. I live in New York city. I was eating out all the time. You know, I wasn't doing the healthiest of diets. But I thought, okay, well, my hearing kind of sucks and this tinnitus kind of sucks and I get dizzy every now and then, but I think I can kind of manage that sometimes. And then after about three or four years, like that's when all of a sudden I had my first vertigo attack and I really kind of felt like, oh shit, I don't know if I can curse or not, but, <laughs> <You can. laughs> but what the hell is going on? Hey. And then things started to progress a little bit more. Very. Yeah. Yeah. It was scary. And luckily for me, my first vertigo attack happened at my uncle's house and I was with him and my aunt and my mother. And we were about to leave to go out to dinner and to see a show. Mm -hmm. And five hours, I was just lying in bed, vomiting. And, but I was in the comfort of their home. And I'm thinking right. if I was on the subway in New York city, my God, like what, what would happen? So those are the things that I started to really get scared about and getting anxious about and paying more attention to right. my condition, which in the beginning, I don't think I really was. No. And I'm, I find it interesting that they diagnosed you with Meniere's without having that vertigo so present. I mean, you, you said you had some dizziness, but not. Right. I had some dizziness yeah. and some imbalance, a little bit of that. You feel like you're just walking on a soft cushion mm -hmm. yeah. and a little bit of that heavy pressure, almost like, you know, your helium balloon and the, and that's starting to kind of inflate inside your head, but that was it. And like I said, the, the vertigo didn't come to later. And then I went back to my doctor and I was like, crap, like, what do I do now? And he threw meclizine at me, you know, then, like I said, I started a little bit more of investigation, a little bit more paying attention, figuring out, should I get another doctor? Like what's happening? Um, and I feel like my journey didn't start until 
until like that midpoint. Right. Gosh, that's huge. That's huge. And how long did the vertigo, you said five hours that first time, did, did it progressively get worse? Was it more frequent for you? I think that luckily that's about the longest I've had it. And I know a lot of people, like, as far as the constant vertigo. Right. So it took me about five hours after that. And then uh, with the meclizine, when I would start to feel a little bit of it coming on, I would pop a little bit, you know, either a half a pill or a full pill. And I would have a vertigo attack, but maybe it would lessen. It wouldn't be the same amount of time. So it kind of fluctuated between just a few minutes to a few hours. But luckily for me, like I said, not for longer than five hours. But then there was a time in like 2021 where I wasn't having the five hours of vertigo, but I was having short stints, but I was having constant like three months of the full head imbalance where there was never, I could kind of function and I could walk and I could do things, but I was totally feeling off. I was totally feeling like I was afraid to walk down. I'm, I'm in a five floor walk up. So oh, I didn't want to leave my apartment because I was afraid to walk down the steps, but I wasn't having full vertigo. So there's, it's been kind of an up and down roller coaster like that over the past few years. Do you think that was weather related? Those three months, those I think it was barometric pressure is a, is a huge trigger for me. It's one of my biggest. So I definitely think it was that. Mm -hmm. I think that I also, this is around the time that I started having vestibular migraines, but I didn't know they were vestibular migraines at the time because I had never heard of that. And up until I started with a new doctor, then I kind of learned that it was, I think a combination between the regular Meniere's vestibular migraines and then towards the end I realized it was a little bit of BPPV at the same time goodness yes they all kind of so it, overlap yeah, it, exactly it all kind of overlapped I think in those three months and then you know I was able to kind of figure out with my doctor like what was going on were you a chronic migraine sufferer before all this no no wow. I would have set um sinus mm -hmm. infections and sinus headaches but I never was bad into migraines or anything like that. How do your vestibular migraines present? I know some present with pain, some don't. Mine, it's not so much pain. Like I know some people say it's like a knife going into the side of their head. Mine is more like a dull throbbing pressure. That was very similar to the sinus infections or the sinus headaches I would get. So in the beginning, I thought it was just that. Right. I kept taking sinus medicine and of course it wasn't getting any better. So I, it, it's very similar to that. And it also, I think comes with a little bit more nystagmus mm. than I would get typically with them in years. Yeah. That's scary too. The yeah. nystagmus. I I, before my first vertigo attack, I didn't realize that this kind of was like a precursor symptom. But I, the first time I had nystagmus, it was uh, before my first vertigo attack. And I was just sitting on the computer and just everything, you know, the whole, and I was like, what is going on? Right. So um, at that time, I didn't have any other medication besides my diuretic. So it was just, you know, trying to stop, look straight ahead till my head kind of figures out what's going on. And then it was three months of that on and off until my first vertigo attack. And I think had I called my doctor and said, hey, this weird thing is happening, maybe we would have talked about medication or other ways to kind of, you know, suppress that. But I thought, well, this is just another strange Meniere's thing. So I just got to live with it. Do you still have nystagmus? Yes, but not as often. And is I think anything... I stop it a little bit sooner um, right. because now I've gone through vestibular therapy. How did which... you do with that? I... I love it. I it was one of the best things for me. And I know, you know, we could talk a little bit uh, further once we get through the whole story about what I've done to kind of, but vestibular therapy, I think is one of the best things that ever happened to me. And because of that, I have a little bit more tricks and to know when I feel like that's going to start, right. what I can do to kind of suppress it or, you know, make it not last as long. That's great. That's great. I did vestibular therapy for a limited time because my insurance overlapped and I lost my insurance. Um, but there's plenty out there online for people that are not able to get 
therapy, you know, treated by a, a therapist. But then again, there's so much in the online community of the therapist right. putting things out there too. So I think it's huge, huge, huge. Yeah. So all, but I would all also, of you, go ahead. I was going to say, I would also caution people to, if their insurance can't, or they don't have the insurance to cover vestibular therapy. I know there's certain things online, but there's certain exercises depending on what's happening with you that maybe you shouldn't do depending on your condition. Yeah. So I would say talk to any doctor that you have before doing your own therapy because it can make it worse. Just like you shouldn't be doing the Epley maneuver if you don't have BPPV because it can flare up your symptoms. I would suggest trying to scrounge some money up at least for one appointment with the vestibular therapist who can kind of see what your issues are give you a bunch of exercises, show you how to do them, and then you can do them on your own. I'm and so that, glad you said that. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Because yeah. when I, when I went, it was the same thing. My insurance only like, let me go through, I think maybe four or five weeks and it was once a week. So I went, you know, she set up, she's like, here, what your issues are. Here's the exercises you should start. And then I would do them on my own daily and then check in with her once a week and go through the next cycle. Maybe she would add to it or take away one exercise. But I definitely, I, I don't think anybody should start any therapy until they've at least met with one person who, who could tell you what would work best for you. I agree. And they are, they're very open to helping if they understand your circumstances right. as far as saying, yes, follow this, do this. Yeah, it's really, I'm so glad you said that because it's true. We do jump on. Google and YouTube a little too quickly sometimes. And I know the first, when I first started having symptoms, that's the first thing people that didn't know what was going on with me sent me the Epley maneuver to do. And, yeah. and I'm like, yeah, well, I'm not doing any of that on my own. Not until I know what's really going on. So, exactly. well, so did your, when all this started going on, did your life come to a complete halt? It didn't. At first, I think part of that was because I didn't have the vertigo presenting as much in the beginning and the hearing loss that I had was progressive. So some days were good and some days were bad. I was also very lucky that I was working at a company that when I was diagnosed, I told them I was upfront about it, which I know a lot of companies and a lot of people, depending on where they work, they're not able to. But my company had unlimited sick days. As long as you didn't abuse it, we could work from home. So there were days when I would wake up and it wasn't awful, but I could feel my head was a little swollen. My hyperacusis was flaring up. And I thought, if I get on the subway right now and try to get to work, that's not going to be a good thing. But if I stay at home and work, I think I can get through the day. Mm -hmm. And because my employer at the time understood that, that really helped me continue to stay to have a kind of functioning routine. Nice. I think the biggest thing was figuring out my triggers. And like I said, my diet wasn't great in the beginning and I wasn't really on top of what I should have been doing. So I would go out and do certain things or go to certain bars and, you know, drink a lot and then wake up the next day and be like, <laughs> so it was a lot of, it was a lear, more of a learning trial process for me. Right. Um, and then I had days where things would like go around to a halt, depending if I had one or two flare ups. But in the beginning, I was able to get through it pretty well. I think surprisingly, the worst years or times that I had for me was during the pandemic, where mm -hmm like everybody else, I was basically home most of the time. Right. And that didn't really change my life too much because I wasn't doing anything anyway. <laughs> so maybe that was a good thing, you know? It, it, yeah. But I, I've been lucky that way because I know a lot of people's stories uh, have just been devastating and what, what they've gone through. You meet with a lot of people. Are they just people with Meniere's for your project? Yes, mo most of them are just people with Meniere's. And then obviously through that, there's like tentacles into other uh, vestibular disorders and people that I've known and, and connected with. Um, but the project itself is basically just focusing on Meniere's. Well, tell us about it. <laughs> yes. Uh, I know a little bit about it. So uh, I'm doing a documentary, which is called Unheard the Ears of Meniere's. And it basically 
kind of came about a little bit pre-pandemic where I think I had mentioned I was a film and television publicist for many years and was downsized from my company and still looking for work, but I really didn't want to do PR anymore. And I thought, well, I'd love to get more into development and production, but I've never developed anything. So it was like, okay, how do I show people that I have the skills to do this? And somebody mentioned, well, what do your own project mm -hmm. and, you know, come up with something and then you could show people that you can do this. So I thought, well, if I'm going to basically do a passion project for no money and on my own time, and what, what is that topic going to be? Like, what am I going to do? And how is it going to be different than anything else that we've seen out there? And it was around the same time where I was having my vertigo bouts, where I was paying a little bit more attention to finding out more about this disease and this syndrome and connecting on Facebook support groups. So that all kind of meshed like right around the same time. And as I was chatting with other people, they were all saying the same thing. Like, nobody understands what this is. It's an invisible illness. Like, try to explain it to people. And nobody gets it. You know, they can sympathize, but only to a point. Right. So I started thinking, well, how can we change that? You know, how can we, besides just telling people, oh, I have vertigo. You know, what if we can show people visually what vertigo is like? Or what if we can use sound and sound design so that people can hear what our tinnitus is like and what our hearing loss is like and film can do that so right. i thought okay well you know nobody's talking about this and it's around the same time that you know ryan adams uh huey lewis christian chenoweth they were talking about it a little bit more so i thought well somebody should make a documentary about this and use the tools of visual filmmaking and audio tech, you know, the technology behind that. So that when people watch it, it's not just me saying, Hey, I had this horrible vertigo bout, but actually simulating what that looks like for someone. Wow. And wow. I thought, well, I have this condition. I, even though I've never produced a film before, I have some contacts, let me do this. And I started working on it, you know, developing it, the 2019 and also to go out there and film anything so this past year it's gotten a little bit more off the ground but i'm really excited because i think it's you know like i said a great way to be able to educate people like for example my when i first started developing this i ran into a guy named richard einhorn who has other vestibular and hearing issues but he worked in the recording industry so he created some sound samples to explain to people like what that distortion sounds like to him. And I have one of them um, on our social media and also on our website. Mm -hmm. And he sent it to me and I played it for my mother. And I could see like watching her, she's listening to this. She's kind of like, oh, that's what it sounds like for you. It was that instant recognition of, now she gets it now when she has to get my attention and it's not about sound levels it's not about yelling but it's about maybe sometimes speaking slower and speaking a little more distinctively and i thought oh my god like that's the moment we want that is the moment that everybody wants from the people around them is that aha uh, yeah i get it and wow. i'm hoping that we can bring some of that to people i got chills <laughs> Um, and then also, wow. you know, with more awareness, as I keep saying, hopefully more funding, because, right. you know, it, it, it's not a condition that kills you. So the sympathy level isn't as high. And, mm. and it's not like it's a battle against those other diseases like cancer. Right. But it's also getting the attention of someone to say, hey, this may not kill you, but this debilitates millions of people and they can't work and their relationships break up. And they lose a part of themselves. And if maybe we had some more research out there, we could find ways to live a little bit better or right. maybe get better treatments. And people aren't gonna throw money at something they don't know and they don't understand. So right. hopefully with this, with the podcast you're doing, with the book that Steve's writing and the compilation that 
you know, Julianne is doing Mm -hmm. with that, it'll elevate many years to the level where if you say, Hey, I've got many years disease, people, it's like, they understand a little bit of what that means. Like if you said I had Parkinson's or if you said I had MS, it's that recognition. Yeah. It's so hard because I find that when we do the things like for Vita, those two times a year raising awareness, I, it's hard to get outside of our immediate community. Yeah. And it's, those are the tentacles. I love that term that you use that we need to branch mm-hmm. out to people that aren't aware, not just our immediate community. And that's, that's a huge struggle. It's, it's it really, it's really getting people to share um, that vulnerability outside of our community. And it's, um, it's almost preaching to the choir. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're talking and there, there's importance in that because developing that community mm-hmm. is amazing. And the, the connections have, I need that. With people like you and like that has made my life so much better just hearing other people who understand but then mm-hmm. like, like you said it's getting it out there it's getting it out to people number one to our media circle so that they kind of understand and then to our doctors who aren't our ENTs our regular you know internists and even dentists and, and other people that should know about it and then the greater community at large so that you know I always give the example I I use the subway because everybody can understand how the subway could be such a a trigger. Yeah. But if I get on that and I'm kind of stumbling around, you know, people, oh, it's New York City. She's drunk, you know, 12 o'clock in the afternoon. But if I say, hey, no, I have many years. Oh, I I kind of get with that. Or I have a vestibular disorder, you know, just like people don't even know what the word vestibular means. Right. And a project you know, like Steve's book and this film can hopefully get to those people. Right. So that, that recognition, um, you know, it starts to build. Right. It's huge. I mean, just, it's going to take everybody, anybody with that hears our voices that's sharing about it. What else are you working on besides um, this? Definitely. I'm freelancing, so I kind of pick up projects every now and then. I do do events logistics for a friend of mine who puts on high-end car shows. Ooh. So she does it here in New York and in Florida. So I kind of help her with, you know, all of the components that need to be put together to kind of make that uh, happen. And it involves, well, what's interesting about her, I know nothing about cars. You know, I know you can get in and you could drive them, but like classic cars, I know nothing about, but she's trying to change it in a way where these events go from being like old white man stuffy events for only rich people to like anybody that has an appreciation for just beauty and cars, like, and bring in music and brings in a curation of high-end sneakers that are matched to the car. So it's like very young and hip. Um, that? and more accessible and diverse than the typical old-fashioned car shows so I do that a couple times a year with her which is really nice um really cool and fun and you travel with that yeah I travel with that you know now that now that things are opening up a little bit more which is really good and she's looking to expand so that that's a lot of fun and that's different and I spend a lot of time with my mom in Jersey um you know helping her and taking care of her uh, which, you know, is a blessing that I'm able to do that. Yeah. And just, you know, working on the project and just trying to move that forward as, as much as possible. Awesome. Well, how are your symptoms today? Today actually is not too bad. I put in my Weather X earplug um, to make sure that the barometric pressure wasn't too bad. And I have my hearing aids in. Um, and today I feel like, you know, the tinnitus is always there. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, and the level, it's pretty low right now. It's a little bit of a pulsating kind of noise. And I have a little bit of pressure here in the front of my head, but that's about it. I, I popped in a Valium because I wanted to make sure that I didn't have any nystagmus or vertigo during this. Because, you know, computers and screens sometimes aren't your friend. But I'd say... Um, I say I'm probably at a five. And this this is something I want to mention. Oh. When I talk to people who don't have chronic illnesses, you know, and 
one point that when I try to describe to people what it's like to live with a chronic illness, because I think one thing that we can all probably understand is that we don't act sick, we act healthy. Right. So even when we're feeling like crap, we need to go about our day, we need to have some, time to, some kind of interaction with people. So we pretend and we act like we're feeling okay. So a lot of times when people look at us, even though things inside aren't that great, you know, we're, we're not feeling at our best. So when we do have symptoms, people are surprised because you're like, oh, you know, we go on one minute, you're fine. The next minute you're not. And what I try to explain to my friends is that without a chronic illness, if on your best day from one to 10, you usually wake up and you're out of one. You know, no mm -hmm. cold, no stuffy head, you're feeling good. And then it progresses. For me, my best day starts at a five. So there's always something, there's always something going on. Right. Always a symptom that's affecting you every day. It's just the level of how it affects you, how much and how many symptoms at one time. Because one day it might just be fatigue. One day it might just be, you know, the tinnitus and the hearing loss or the ear pressure. One day it might be vertigo. So my best day every day, I wake up at a five, but I act like I'm at a one. Mm -hmm. yes, so I think today I'm at a five. I'm pretty good. Yesterday, right. I'd say like a six, six and a half. But the problem is with the chronic illness is that level between five and 10 is much shorter than other people where it's one to 10. Right. So that one or two little tiny symptom flare-ups all of a sudden brings you to an eight very quickly yeah. and that i think is something that people who don't live with a chronic illness mm -hmm. always have to try to keep in mind when they're dealing with someone like oh they look fine they're okay but you know what like they're not they're they're just doing their best to get through the day right yeah that's a very good point it's true. And, and it takes you longer to get from that eight back down than, exactly. yeah, that's a very good, it's, I know I've heard the spoon theory, which I've kind of faded that out, but it's so true that we do start. I, I probably started about a three, even though today I didn't sleep very well. So <laughs> probably started later than that, but yeah, that's a great way of looking at it. It is absolutely crazy. Um, the way that we're interpreted. I mean, fatigue for me, sometimes I will be having a great day and then everything just drains out of me mm -hmm. like in an instant. And I can go from a great place to just needing or wanting just to curl up. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. tough. Fatigue is weird for me because before it was never really too much of a symptom. And about a year or two ago, I woke up one day and I felt like I was drugged. I mm. felt like I took like five meclizines or, you know, like a handful of Xanax. I was just, my whole body was just depleted. And I'm like, what is this? And it was at the time during COVID. So I thought like, oh no, I have COVID and I'm staying with my mom and she's, you know, in her eighties. So I like ran to get tested and it wasn't COVID. So I was like, what? And it lasted two days. And then the next day I was fine. And I'm like, went to the Facebook page. It's like, hey guys, tell me about fatigue. <laughs> and then I started hearing all this stuff and I'm like, that's what it was. So now just randomly, like at least once a month, I'll have two days, usually of fatigue where it just hits out of nowhere. I just feel like my body can't move. And then after that, it's gone. Right. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, you said, you mentioned um, like a couple days a month. Do you think that could be any relation to hormones? You know, it, it's interesting you bring that up because I, I definitely think it can be. I um, am in menopause now, so yeah. that has been a big adjustment. And I think that has hurt, or I shouldn't say hurt, but contributed to some of years flare-ups as well. Because anytime your hormones are out of control, it just upsets everything in, right. in your body. And I have been on HRT for the past couple of years, mm -hmm. hormone replacement therapy which has definitely helped, but things still change. You know, your body is still going through this process that is just very different. Um, so yes, I, I, I think that can play a, a big part of it too. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to learn a little bit more about that because I'm finding as I'm in menopause as well, I'm trying to see if there's any relation and if I can follow it and see if, you know, I can say, oh gosh, tomorrow's the day, you know, <laughs> I don't know. It'd be nice to know ahead of time. Right. So. And um, I was going to say it's, I think now people are starting to talk a little bit more openly about menopause. I think years ago, it was always hush tones, like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going through this. But now since I started like through the perimenopause phase into the menopause phase, I tell everybody I have been, uh, you know, I, my girlfriends, my friends, I'm like, I'm having a hot flash right now. I, I don't know what's going on with me. Like, but I will tell anybody what this is like because it's the same thing with Meniere's unless you talk about it people don't understand and I think what's tough with the Meniere's and having a chronic illness is that anything else on top of that even just a small cold even you know uh, a sinus infection anything even like so a couple of years ago I broke my foot mm -hmm. and very different from a vestibular issue to a broken foot but my healing time and how my body felt and presented itself because now my body didn't know what to do. My immune system didn't know what to do. Like, cause it spends all of its energy kind of figuring out what's going on here and making up for your imbalance and making up for the ear pressure. And now it has to deal with this broken foot. So to right. me, it's like your immune system gets all confused because it doesn't know what to focus on. There's only so much energy, so much spoons. Right. You know, your immune system <laughs> yeah. has. So I'm very cautious, you know, right now against COVID, against the flu, because even if it's a mild case of COVID, whatever people think that is, you know, it's still not good for you and it still can cause long-term things. It's going to be harder for me to fight that off while my body is also dealing with many years. Yeah. And that's something that I think is important for people to know. So whether it's a broken foot, anything on top of your chronic illness that makes it harder for your body to respond and heal itself is going to wreak more havoc on your system. And that's what's hard to, to remember. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. I think that's when I get most frustrated with many years. So I think I've learned my day to day how to live with it. Right. But then when you have something else thrown on top of it, yeah, it's, it just amplifies. Yeah, it just amplifies it, and mm -hmm. and it just um, it's much harder to rebound and to to get through that. Yes, it really is. Um, before I forget this thought, I wanted to go back. You mentioned something about the Facebook groups that you go, you went in, and you did a search on a particular subject, mm -hmm. um, and then looked at what people were saying. Um. I already forgot what you what it, what you did the search on. It was for oh, fatigue. fatigue. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, brain fog. Yes, it was for fatigue. I think that what you said is a great way for people to utilize these Facebook groups. I know that if you go in and you continue to start scrolling, you can get pulled into so many bad places. But mm -hmm. um, I don't think people realize that they can go in and and do a search in these groups for whatever you're looking for. And um, and that it just narrows it down and then you can feel like, okay, I'm not alone with this or reach out for questions, not that mindless scroll through exactly. all of that. Yeah, no, that, that is a very good point. And it took me a while because at first I didn't know you could do that. I'm not very social media savvy. Mm -hmm. I'm basically on social media because of the documentary, because like you need to be. So when I first started, people would say, oh, there's so many conversations about that. Do a search. And I'd be like, what? And then I learned how to do that. So you'd search in vert. And then, like you said, you would find all these different posts about it. So you're not asking the same questions over and over and over again. Right. Um, and that, that is a great way to kind of learn, you know, um, not for a lot of medical advice, because like we said, get information from people, but then talk to your doctors about it, but also to find out what should I be talking to my doctor about? Like mm -hmm. I didn't know in the beginning what questions I should be asking him. I didn't know that I should have gotten an MRI, you know, right. way back in the beginning. And then- Or how to describe dizziness and vertigo. There's so many different ways to de exactly, describe it. Exactly, yeah. and I think one of the, the biggest things that led to me 
just starting to get a little bit more control over, you know, my health, health in general was moving from an ENT to a neurotologist, yeah. to someone who specializes a little bit more because my ENT was nice. He was helpful. Like I said, he didn't give me a ton of information. He didn't dismiss me, but also wasn't providing me with a lot of guidance. And then once I found a neurotologist, which you have to separate from a neurologist, which was a little confusing in the beginning, yet the neurologist is the expert in the surgeons on the ear side and the vestibular side. I had an appointment with a neurotologist who is also actually one of the medical experts in the documentary, which is great. So it kind of comes full circle. Um, but all of a sudden through her, I, I got the CT scan, I got the MRI, I had a VNG, an ENG, like all of those tests that I never had in the beginning. Right. You know, um, by this point I was bilateral. So there was a lot more going on. And then she, um, I told her, I said, you know, I'm on meclizine, but the meclizine makes me exhausted. And sometimes you want that. I want to take a pill and just go to sleep. But then there's other days where I need to function. And my ENT would not give me Valium. He said, they only give you Valium when it's in the hospital. And she's like, no, I'll, I'll give you a low dose of Valium, which right. saves my life because I can take that. It doesn't make me sleepy personally, and I can get through the day. So I got on, you know, better medication. She's the one that introduced me to vestibular therapy. I had no idea that was a thing until then. She was the one that told me about vestibular migraines. I didn't know that that was a thing. So you have to take control of your own health. I think we all are learning that now. We have to be our own advocates and we have to make sure that we're partnering with a doctor that is going to talk to us about this, but also open the doors of saying, hey, you have these issues. Have you tried vestibular therapy? Right. Uh, no, I've never heard of vestibular therapy. So that's, you know, I... I think was a little bit of a diatribe. I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> okay. No, it's it's true. Uh, the team, having a team, a medical team that's working with you is so important. And sometimes um, you get to a point where you butt heads and you have to separate from that team and find another, but you have to, you really do have to fight for yourself and find your voice for yourself. And that was hard for me at the beginning. And I'm a nurse and I was still was treated like crap by a lot of doctors and stuff like that. You know, that nightmare stuff you hear, but until I took control of um, more control of my appointments and what I wanted to get from my team, I, I, I kept searching. So you can find them, they're out there, but it's gonna take hitting the pavement and doing some work. Yeah, yeah. and it's and it's unfortunate that it, it has to be that much work. And it's unfortunate to the system that we have, you know, you can be limited by your insurance of who you can see and where you can go. And a lot of people who don't live near big cities don't have those type of specialists and might have to drive hours in order to get to them, to see them. And they might have to pay out of pocket for that. And that could be very, very, very expensive. And, um, you know, it's, it's a journey. <laughs> it's, it's a journey. <laughs> That could be very tough. And if you don't have a good support system and if you don't know where you need to go and if you don't have directions of where you need to drive on your journey, then you're just, you know, going around in circles. And I think a lot of us have had those experiences. And unfortunately, some are longer than others. You know, one, one woman I talked to, it, it was 10 years until she got a diagnosis. And that, that's, it's crazy. It, it's unfortunate. Yeah. How can you live that that's way? Sure crazy. Yeah. And, because how, getting that, just that initial diagnosis was just a weight off. It didn't change anything really, right. but it was just a way forward, you know? Yeah. That's so hard. So hard. What is living with a vestibular disorder taught you, Janine? It taught me how to say no. I think that's the biggest thing. I think in the beginning, I didn't want to miss out on things. I didn't want to not go to that party or not go to that restaurant or that concert. And I wanted to participate in life. And I started to realize that I can't at the level that I used to. And I would feel very guilty if I had to cancel on friends or if I'd say like, no, you know what, that, that doesn't work for me. Or, you know, going, traveling that far, uh, you know, on a train doesn't right. work. 
So I think that's the first thing is realizing my limits, but not being limited by them. Right. If that makes sense. I love you know, that. Yeah. Say limits, it's such a negative term to say I live with limits and I do. Mm-hmm. And I acknowledge that, but I also have to balance how far I can go outside of that comfort zone. And if I need to say no to a friends, to a project, to anything, I do it and I do it without guilt. Right. And that took a long time, you know, because of, we get into, like I said before, that acting mode. We want to oh, yeah. act healthy. You know, we want to pretend like we're as, feeling as good as everybody else because you don't want to talk about it all the time. No. It, as much as, you know, my mom asks me every day, how are you feeling? How's your head? Usually I'll be like, it's fine. It's fine. I'm, I'm all good. That's well, it. some days <laughs> it's a little worse. I'll say that. Yeah. But you get bored. You don't want to talk about it. And you know your friends and your family don't want to hear it all the time. So you get in that acting mode where it's constantly like, I'm up. I'm good. I'm feeling fine. I'm cheery. When inside, I just want to like crawl into bed and go to sleep. Yeah. So yeah, knowing knowing my limitations, not feeling guilty, and sometimes putting myself first, I think, uh, are the big things that I've learned about having this condition. I think um, a lot of us are uh, used to be people pleasers and want to do everything. And but I will tell you, learning to say no the first couple of times it's so hard, but it is so empowering once you're able to get past that process and just know that, okay, you know, you don't have to be rude about it, but the way you say it in the delivery and being true to yourself and right. saying, no, nope, just maybe another time or yeah, it's, it, it takes time, but it is, it's tough at first, but it does get easier. Yeah. You know? And yeah. I think it's also educating your friends and family to know when not to push you. So say, for example, you know, you live on a boat, which is amazing. I still don't know how you, how you do that. For you, it works. And I, my friend used to have a boat and I went on his, um, you know, before my symptoms started to get a little progressively worse. But if someone came to me right now and said, you know, uh, let's go on a cruise, I would, I would say no because I don't know how it's going to affect me. I, the last time I was even on a boat for an hour or so, because we have ferries that go around the city. You know, I could do a ferry from uptown to downtown, 15 minutes, that's fine. Anything longer than that, then I, I start to feel like it's not working for me. So I would tell somebody like, no, 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 that, that, that doesn't work for me, go have fun. Mm-hmm. And then they would try to be like, but you could do this if you start to feel bad or, there was something, you know, they would try to kind of convince you and mm-hmm. give you examples of why maybe it won't be so bad. And I think you have to just very nicely tell people, you know what, I understand what you're doing. I appreciate that you want me to participate in this, but you have to know if I'm saying no, that there's a lot of reasons and I want to do it. It's not that I don't want to do it. Like, hell yes, I would love to jump and go on a cruise, you know, tomorrow. But if I'm saying no, just honor that yeah. and don't, don't push and give me examples and, you know, yeah. because it, it just makes it harder. Right. And that's been tough. It's like, number one, learning to do it for yourself, but then try to training the people around you to just honor that when you say it yeah. and not, you know, push back on it. Right. Yeah. I've also um, talked to a couple other vestibular people where people stop inviting you. And when I have found out that in the past, I'm like, don't stop inviting me, please right. keep inviting me. I might surprise you one day, but mm-hmm. I want to be included and all that good stuff. So um, I remember just the concerts and I'm just reading your Jersey girl and that you have seen Bruce. How many times you need? <laughs> I have seen him with a rough estimate at least 77 times no, and that actually crazy. isn't that much in the, in the Bruce community there are people I've met who have seen him hundreds of times but I have to say it those 77 times have all been in the tri-state area I have not you know flown because I've never really had the money to fly to California to see him or like or fly to Ireland I would love to it's and there are a lot of people that do that they'll just you know travel around so I've seen him that many times in the tri-state area, I flew once to Tampa Bay 
um, I was at the Super Bowl when he performed. Oh my so goodness. I was, I was a big football <laughs> fan. Um, my brother and I did that. So it was the only time I technically traveled. Right. But yes. But he, um, in New Jersey, because obviously he's a Jersey guy, he, at least in the past, it, not so much anymore because he's a little bit older, but he would come and do 15 shows at the Meadowlands. And his shows are always different. Like there's the, a core amount of songs like that he'll always sing, like Born to Run and Promised Land. But he changes up his set list oh, yeah. every night. So every concert is different. You know, the majority yeah. of the songs you're going to hear. So people would think like I would get tickets for as many of those 15 shows. So within a two week <laughs> span, there were times when I maybe saw him six or seven times. Goodness, that's awesome. <laughs> it, took me, it took me 66 concerts to hear the song Kitty's Back for the first time sung live. Wow. So that's why I've seen him. <laughs> Number one, he's just amazing. I love him. Um, but that's that's the reason why I've seen him so so many times. And I, I'm going, my friend got tickets to see him in the stadium September 1st. And I think this will be the first major concert I go to since having the hearing loss since having hearing aids and since having like a little bit worse in symptoms so I was gonna ask you about that <laughs> I, yeah I'm not sure how it's gonna work out um but for him I'm gonna give it a try <laughs> hey you'll just have to bring all your tools with you and just have an out <laughs> exactly you know, I, awesome. have, I always have my rescue medicine around my neck I always have my earplugs with me you know we all have our little kit that we bring with us just in case, so. That's exciting. Well, before we go on to whirlwind questions, is there anything else you wanna share with the community? Um, I think number, number one is thank you. Thank you to everybody in the community that has helped me personally, just in talking with you guys on Facebook and now all these Zoom meetings, which we have. And if you're not part of the Zoom mini years group, Mm -hmm. please just do mini year support group zoom. And, you know, it's one thing to talk to people via chat and like uh, through on Facebook, but when you see people in person, you know, like this, it just connects you even more. So I encourage everybody to do that. And, and thank you for all the support you've given me personally and for my project. And um, I think, you know, if there's a couple different ways, if I could do a little self promotion, for the Ew. film that people can help us with to try to get this off the ground. Um, the status that we're in right now, we received a small grant last year and we were able to do two days worth of filming. So we filmed with Guy Kawasaki, who's a kind of notable name, um, especially in tech world in Silicon Valley. He has a podcast called Remarkable People and he's been through the Meniere's journey. He's now just got a cochlear implant and he's a podcaster. So, and just a ray of hope. And that's one thing about the film. We want to end in a ray of hope. Like there's, there's things we can do. There's things we could try. And then we also did um, uh, one day filming at the House Institute Foundation. They have a Meniere's research clinic. So we talked to an expert there about what is happening on the research side and what they're trying to do to formulate new treatments and everything. So now we're continuing to fundraise so that we can continue our production. So obviously, you know, if anybody can give a donation, that'd be great. I understand financially, they're myself, a lot of bucks aren't rolling in, a lot of people are on disability. So if you can give anything a little bit, we have links on our website that you can go to, to donate as much as, five, little as $5, as much as, as you want. Um, if you have friends and family that are in a position to do that, that would be great. Um, and we're also going after corporate sponsorships. So like, you know, Weather X I use all the time for my barometric pressure is a great uh, product that can be used for many years people. So we're looking at companies that have a natural integration, you know, hearing aid companies. So if anybody has a particular favorite product that they use that they thinks like, hey, they might want to sponsor our film, let me know. Um, the other thing that people can do is just follow us on social media, I think is a big thing because the support groups, you know, are private and they should be, right. but, you know, these donors and people that give and the, the sponsors, they want to know that there's a community out there 
that is interested in this film and interested in their products because they want a little give and take as well. So I can't really show them the 30,000 people that are on the Meniere's disease support group because that's private. So if I could show them that activation we're having on our social media, and it's not about the numbers, I don't get paid off that and ads and stuff like that. But if I can say like, hey, I have this group of people that are following me that are interested in this film that want to see this film made, and that are sharing our content, then it kind of proves to people that there's a community out there. So it could just be as simple as that. Um, and people can go to our website, which is uh, uh, on here, earsofmanyears.com. Um, that goes, links right to Second Chapter Productions, which is the company, uh, my company that is producing and directing it. So um, yeah, and just, you know, on our website, we have a little page where you can submit your Meniere's journey. Tell us what's happened to you. Tell us about your symptoms because we want to hear all about how it affects people so we can then take that information bring it into the film and, you know, it kind of show people's journeys to the best of our ability to do that. Um, that. Yeah. And one other thing just to say really quick about, cause I've had a lot of people ask me like, are you focusing on this? Are you focusing on that? Are you talking about different things? I think with this film, we need to do, I mean, years 101. That's how we're looking at it. It's, you know, a maybe one hour film, maybe 70 minutes at the most that we'll be able to pay for it to put together. And it's an introduction to many years to people that may not know about it. It's kind of like saying, hey, this exists. This is what happens to people that have it. This is how we can help them. And then getting into the minutia, like it's starting the conversation. And then from there, then maybe we can start talking more about like cervical chiropractic care and all these other little uh, TMJ and these other elements that might have a connection to it. But we can't do that in, in our film and we don't have the money to make it like an eight parter, <laughs> unfortunately. So just anybody looking at this, it's, it's gonna be a broad overview of the condition and an emotional journey so that hopefully it'll be educational and entertaining. It's a, it's a very delicate balance to strike, you know, wh when you're making a documentary. So don't look for this to answer all of your questions about everything. We won't be able to do that, but hopefully it will provide, like I said, a, a really great understanding of, of what this is. Awesome. Well, I will try to include all of that and at least get them in the right direction um, in the show notes. Thank you. Sure. No problem. Yeah, you have links to everything. And, um, you know, anybody can always reach out to me. I'm, I'm very open to talk and discuss with anybody about anything. Yay. <laughs> yes. And there's thir Thursday night meetings, right? Thursday yes. Thursday night is our meeting. There's yeah. the, the Meniere support group has a uh, 10, yeah. 10 o'clock, a two, a five, and they just started at 830. And then there's a general vestibular chat. Mm -hmm. which um, isn't Meniere specific, but other, specific. actually all of them. Like, even if you don't have, you can go to anyone. If you don't have Meniere's, you can still go to the Meniere's ones because so many vestibular disorders overlap with each other that we're all kind of in the same boat. And then that one's on Thursday at eight, I believe, eight Eastern. These are all Eastern times. But, eight Eastern, yeah. yeah. And I'll include those two. I don't think I've been including the support groups, but I really should because they are so great just to even if you just go on you don't have to have your camera on and just listen and um, yeah. and then slowly open up and and ask a question or whatever it'd be great because there's a good group of people well um are you ready for whirlwind question i think so <laughs> there's no wrong answer <laughs> all right it's like see. rapid fire like i have to get back it to is. you quickly it, yeah but it's um some of them are a little bit more lengthy but fill in the blank Vestibular disorders are hell. You feel your symptoms coming on and you're trying to be brave. Janine, what's the first thing you do? Take a volume and smile. I think when I start to feel crappy, if I smile and I start to give myself some positive energy, it kind of relaxes my system and, and helps if that makes sense. It does. It does. I'm one of those smilers. I'm like, okay, am I just smiling or is it full face smile? <laughs> yeah. 
it's amazing what that can do for you. Uh, let's see. What's one thing people usually get wrong about you? That I'm not as cranky as I appear to be. <laughs> I'm, really? I'm, I don't, well, I don't. My, humor, my humor is very sarcastic. Yeah. And some people don't relate to that or understand that as much. And to me, that is a way that I am friendly with people. And mm -hmm. I've had a lot of people come to me and say, when I first met you, I thought you were a bitch. But then I understood <laughs> your sense of humor right. and then they got me. So I think, I think I can come off a little bit harsher than I really am sometimes. Okay. I didn't see you that way, but <laughs> <laughs> what, what is your favorite vestibular friendly meal? Oh God. Um, I make almost every day for lunch, a salad mm -hmm. with grilled chicken, apple, avocado, a little bit of salt-free raw walnuts and um, so something, a little bit of feta cheese. Mm -hmm. And I find that that's like with a little bit of um, a no salt or low salt, like Asian se sesame sauce. Oh, that sounds lovely. <laughs> and it's really good and it's very low in sodium and it's healthy and fresh because I've been trying to get away from processed food and sugar. Sugar is my enemy. That's like, a, especially now, perimenopause, sugar, just I get cravings and I binge. So eating a nice fresh salad with some lean protein um, is, is my go-to that I enjoy. You know, sugar does this similar thing for me that salt does. If I have too much sugar, I get the fullness in yep. my ears the same as the salt. So, yeah, sugar yeah. is very inflammatory. Yeah. And, but it's, you know, I've never been a salt eater. I've never salted my food when I was growing up. I, I don't have that craving. So that's a good thing, but, and sure. alcohol, <laughs> I like to drink, but it doesn't affect me that much, which is good. You know, I'm a McGoldrick. I need my Guinness, <laughs> but, uh, but sugar. Yeah. That's, that's my downfall. That's the toughest for me. That is hard. Well, that sounds lovely though. Your meal. What's the last show you binged and loved? Beef. Beef. What's that Beef. on? Uh, it's a, um, it's on Netflix. It's a 10 part series. Uh, Stephen Yeo and Allison Chong. Mm. Ali, Ali Cho. She, I'm confusing her name with her character name and her actress name. Um, but anyway, it's about two people that uh, get in a road rage incident. And they find out who each other are and they start trying to one up to get over on each other and insanity ensues. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Okay. <laughs> it just landed on Netflix and um, it's a mostly Asian cast, which is great to see. So it's very diverse. Um, it's got like a dark sense of humor that I love. And it's different. It's like, I've never seen a show like that before. So anytime there's a, a premise that's interesting, um, I, it's really well done. So cool. check it out. Yeah, I'll we'll do that. What is your favorite novel? My favorite novel is called The Brief History of the Dead. And it came out, I don't know, maybe over 10 years ago. And I think I reread it every year, but it's about this afterlife when people die, they go to an afterlife and it's almost like a regular community, like they're on earth where people have jobs and they do stuff. And they remain in that afterlife up until the last person on earth remembers them. Oh, wow. And then after that, they kind of like disappear into, we don't know what. And oh, that sounds so interesting. And something happens on earth where a lot of people start dying and overloading this afterlife and then people started disappearing more quickly because all the people that remember them start to disappear oh and that's all i'm going to say about it that but sounds so interesting yeah it's just so so well done and so creative and so thought-provoking okay. about you know i'm not someone who is deeply religious and believes in a big afterlife or whatever but the concept of that just sounds like amazing and sad at the same time, wow. you know, that you can exist for as long as there are people on earth who remember you. Wow. Um, and I, I find that, that thought very compelling. 
Yeah. There's a child's movie. I don't know if you watch any children's movies it's called Coco. Um, oh, gosh, I don't even. And it's about day, the Day of the Dead. And it, oh, yes. Yes. yes, yes. And With the grandmother and there, she kind of comes back. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah, it reminds me of that because they're the last person remembering. I don't know. I haven't watched it in a long time, but that's, I'm very interested in that. It sounds very cool. What's the name of that again? It's called The Brief History of the Dead. I actually have it right next to me. And cool. I picked it up because I thought this cover was just amazing. It was so intriguing to me. I'm like, what is that about? Um, and yeah, it's really um I actually, you know, when I told that story earlier about creating my own project, my own film project to kind of get moving, I thought about adapting this. That was the first thing I wanted to go to is like, oh, this has to be a book. But a studio already has the rights to do it. They've oh. owned the rights for the past 10 years. I don't know what they're doing with it. But if I had the money and if the rights were available, then that would be the film that I would be making. Wow. In, in addition to the documentary, of course. Of course. <laughs> what is your favorite movie? Uh, the um, Philadelphia Story with mm. Catherine Hepburn, James Stewart. Oh, and I'm, I'm a big classic movie buff and I just love that film. I think the writing is so smart and the directing, three of the best actors ever known to man. And it's romantic and comedic and dramatic all at the same time. Really good. So that that's my go-to, yeah. What activity completely relaxes you? Hmm. I don't want to say meditation because obviously that's what it's meant for. <laughs> right. So I think that's kind of a cop out answer. But I I would have to say because I'm such a content person, I, you know, I my whole career was in film and television that like sitting back and watching a really good TV show relaxes me even though I'm mentally engaged in it I kind of you know just kind of step out of myself and I get into that world so that's probably the first thing that I would think of that okay. you know besides, like, that and you know drinking a Guinness or a glass of wine <laughs> okay. I get that I get that creativity that if you're once you're on the other side of the camera um, watching something becomes something completely different than it is to someone like myself that's never been on the other side. Right. Um, that it's it's of, strange yeah. because like I started off as a publicist where I'm publicizing. So I always had to get to the root of like, what is this story about? What's the connections? How do I sell this to someone? So whenever I'm watching something, my brain just automatically goes there, even though I don't do it technically anymore. But now I'm on the other side and I'm like, I'm trying to create and direct a film that is going to have, you know, the viewer in me is going to like and yeah. looking at things very differently. So now I'll sit and I'll watch a documentary and I'll think like, oh, that was a good camera angle or, yeah. oh, that's a good question. Or, oh, I liked how they zoomed in on their subject there. So it, it's a very different way of watching. So the times when I can kind of put that thought process aside and just get right into the story, right. like then I, I feel like I just relax and, and melt into, into what I'm watching. <laughs> Very nice. What is your most used tool out of your vestibular toolbox? Do hearing aids count? Yep, they do. You I, actually I, use I, them then. Yeah, I would have to say my hearing aids. And what I love too, for anybody that has hearing aids, I'm going to give a shout out. There's a company called Deaf Metal, D E A F Metal. They're based in Finland, which is a country <coughs> that I want to live in uh, eventually, <laughs> years from now. But they have um, a, a website from the U.S. where they make retention jewelry for your hearing aids. Oh, so just want to show you. Here's my hearing aid, and they have this little thing that goes around, and this hooks and holds onto your hearing aid and claps onto the ear because now with all the mask wearing or just wearing glasses and stuff, your hearing aids just like fly off. And when I found them, I thought, number one, what a wonderful way to like keep your hearing aids, you know, from flying off. But number two is to make wearing hearing aids fun. Yeah. Pretty and accessible. And they have sure. all different types of designs that either latch here and they also, if your ears are pierced, which mine are not, they can connect to your actual earrings here. 
So I'm excited every time. Yeah, death Before, metal. Like, oh, I feel like an old lady. I have to put my hearing aids in. But now I get so many compliments on my hearing aid jewelry that's that cool. it makes it fun. And I think that that's um, probably what, what I use most often. That and then conversely would be earplugs. Like in my little pouch here, I also always have little foam earplugs with me because I have the hyperacusis. So when I go out and walk out on the shoots of New York City, mm -hmm. oh. turn, turn my hearing aids down. And sometimes I take them off and I put a foam earplug in mm -hmm. because sirens and just cars and honking and getting on the subway, it's very loud. So mm -hmm. I alternate all day between hearing aids and earplugs and even high fidelity earplugs. Like sometimes you need a little sound to come in there. So yeah. Cool. Very cool. And your last question is, what are you extremely grateful for today? You. Aw. I, I <laughs> Yes. No, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful that you do this podcast, that you have invited me on this, that I can have this conversation with you. And I, through you, I also would say, like, you represent the mini years community and the vestibular community. So you and all of those people in that community, I'm so grateful for it because I would never be doing this documentary without you and the community. And I would never have learned so much about how to manage my own chronic illness without that community. So, oh, and I should say my mom. <laughs> of course you need to say your mother. Yes. I well, I'm so happy you were here. To my share Oscar. That. Like I, I have to give a shout out. She, she is, is really like my rock and um, helps me out so much. Well, thank so. you. Thank you for, of course, you have to include your mother. <laughs> and it's been great sharing space with you today, Janine. And I hope to see you in some of the groups and maybe in the future we'll work together on something. Who knows? Janine, thank you so much for what you're doing to bring awareness to the outside world. You are truly an inspiration. If you would like to share your story with Janine or make a donation to the Unheard documentary, please find the link in the show notes. The Ears of Meniers can be found at www.earsofmeniers.com or www.secondchapterproductions.com. On social media, find Janine on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please find these links below in the show notes. You can reach out to me on Instagram or email. I would love to hear from you. What's going on in your world? What would you like to hear more about? What episode resonates most with you? So if you would like to leave me a voice message, please go to www.speakpipe.com forward slash Meniere's Muse. For more information on vestibular disorders, please visit the VITA website at www.vestibular.org. I also want to mention to you about Life Rebalance Chronicles. They just came out last week and you'll hear Marissa's story and I will leave that link below for Life Rebalanced. And we also have the Steps to Balance coming up May 21st through May 27th where we will be spreading awareness about vestibular disorders and encouraging our fellow Vesties to get out and take steps to balance. Whatever that means for you, walking, swimming, bowling, anything that you're comfortable doing, taking one more step to balance, to spread awareness about vestibular disorders to those that have never heard of it. If you enjoy this podcast, please do me a favor and rate, review, and share. Thank you again for listening and remember to love yourself be open to the work, lean on this beautiful community, and lastly, believe that healing is possible. I'll see you next week, warriors.